Good day, Grade 12s. It's great to be with you. Today we're going to be tackling a very important section. It's the section on electrostatics and electric circuits. Now, you might say to me, but we haven't done that. That's Grade 11 work. Yeah, but you're in for a surprise. It counts a whole lot of marks for your Grade 12 final exam. So make sure that you've done some revision. What do you need to know? Well, that's what we're going to be finding out now. Let's have a look at our checklist very quickly. Um, and what I've got here is a checklist so you can make sure that you've learnt the key facts. So where do we start? Make sure that you can do the following, that you can describe and draw a sketch of an electric field around different charged particles. Whether they're positive or negative, you need to be able to draw the field line patterns, remembering the rules for drawing field lines. Field lines mustn't intersect, they must indicate the field position as well. Direction of the field is also very important. So revise those. They're not difficult. You're either going to get a single, you could get a single particle or two particles together, uh, either the same charge or opposite charge or even between parallel plates. Make sure you can do those. Right, what's the next thing that you need to be able to do? In this section, you're going to need to learn some laws and apply them. So you must be able to state and apply the law of conservation of charge, the law of Coulomb's law, which is an electrostatic law telling us the force between charges, and then under electric circuits, you need to know Ohm's law as well. Well, what about some of the other things that are specific to electrostatics? Well, we also need to be able to define electric field strength and potential and electrical energy. I've just written them down as follows, that you need to define and calculate electric field strength produced by a charged object. Now remember there are two formula on your formula sheet. You need to know which ones to use, whether you're using the one with a mother charge or the one where the, both the charges are at a distance. And you're looking for the small charge, the test charge that's placed in the field. Remember the difference between those two formula. Those are non-uniform fields, but we also need to know the electric field strength between parallel plates. The other thing that you're going to need to recall is the function of capaci uh, a capacitor, the effectors affecting capacitance. What do we mean by that? Now remember, a capacitor is really linked to electrostatics. It's a place, a device that builds up on charge, builds up on charge. And the, the factors that affect it are the size of the plates, the area of the plates, and the distance between them, and the potential difference supplied across the plates. Make sure you know those factors. Make sure you can work with changing factors as well. We also need to know how to calculate capacitance. Now, what about when it comes to electric circuits? Well, you need to perform a whole lot of calculations. With electric circuits, you, that, w that might have resistors in series or in parallel and in parallel, we also will be dealing with cells that have an internal difference. The last section that I think is critical for you to know is about energy transfer. These are electrical energy calculations uh, and power calculations using different circuits. You need to be able to work out how energy is transferred in an electric circuit and predict which light bulb, for example, is going to shine the brightest. Well, now that we've done our checklist, let's get straight into it. We're going to focus on electrostatics first of all. Let's have a look at our first question. Here we go. This is taken from the November 2011 paper. It was question 8 on that paper, and it's a nice little warm-up question. It says, two metal spheres, P and T, and they're drawn here, uh, they're put on insulated stands, so they're going to retain their charge. Uh, they have a charge of plus 3 times 10 to the minus 9 coulombs and minus 6 times 10 to the minus 9 coulombs. And they've drawn them and shown them to you. Now, I know that normally we work in SI units, coulombs, but I just want to remind you that they could have given it to you in a smaller unit. So they could have given it to you as 3 
nanocoulombs or minus six nanocoulombs. Remember how you convert when we're dealing with electrostatic charges? Nano means times 10 to the minus nine. Uh, micro means times 10 to the minus six. And pico means times 10 to the minus 12. Make sure you can do the calculations because your answer has to be in SI units. Very important. Now let's see, get back to the question. It says the spheres are uh, allowed to touch each other and are then placed 1,5 meters apart. So these spheres that were originally, uh, one was positive, one was negative, they touch. We know that when things touch each other, isolated spheres touch each other, there's going to be a transfer of charge until they get the same charge and then they separate with a new charge and they're kept 1,5 meters apart from each other. Now, the first question says, in which direction will electrons flow while spheres P and T are in contact? Write down only. When you see this in capital letters, take note of it. Because often they say, write down only, increase, decrease. They don't want a long explanation. They just want those words. When they're marking the final paper, that's what they want to see. They don't want an essay or a discussion. They just want those words. So let's try and give them the right answer here. Now, have a look at the original charges. We had this one, which has extra electrons. This one is minus 6 times 10 to the uh, minus 9 uh, coulombs, uh, minus 6 nanocoulombs. This one has uh, less electrons. It's got a positive charge. Now remember where charge comes from. Charge comes from the fact that atoms have protons and electrons. When things have more electrons, they become negatively charged. When they lose electrons, they come, become positively charged. When we touch two charged objects together, only the electrons can move. So in which direction are the electrons going to be moved? They remember electrons are negative. We know like charges repel each other. So these ones sitting on the uh, sphere T, they're uncomfortable. They want to get more space. They want to spread out. And they're attracted to the positive charges. So they're going to jump across from T to P. Why? Because of the laws of attraction. We need to apply that. And I hope you can see that the answer has to be they move from the negative charge, which was T. So T is negative. They're going to move from T to P. So we must write that down. From T to P. Right, let's move on. Calculate the net charge gained or lost by sphere P. So first of all, the first thing that we need to do is to say, right, what has happened? Electrons moved from T to P. We want to know what the charge was that moved on to uh, P. So we're going to say it must have gained electrons. So it gained charge. So it didn't lose, it gained some negative charge. Uh, let's try and work out how, how this has happened. And the law that we're going to do, or that we're going to apply here, is the law of conservation of charge. We can't lose any electrons, we can't lose any charge. So remember that when two things touch, they get a new charge. So the new charge is equal to the charge that was on P, plus the charge that was on T, and we divide it by 2. Now, in this case, I think it's easier to work with the smaller units because uh, even though we know that they're in SI units as times 10 to the minus 9, uh, you know what, you might just make a mistake. And it's not difficult to work, to convert, and then work back, and that's what I'm going to do. So I'm going to say, what was the charge on uh, P? It was 3 nanocoulombs, and... That was positive 3 nanocoulombs, and on P, or on T at least, it was negative 6 nanocoulombs. Now, look here. If we divide, if we say 3 plus uh, minus 6, that's going to give you minus 3. Divide by 2, it's going to give you minus 1 and a half nanocoulombs. Let me convert that back into SI units and say minus 1 times 10 to the minus nine coulombs and that's the new charge but guys that wasn't what it asked 
it says what's the net charge gained so let's see what p was initially p was initially at the start was look back on the diagram minus 6 nanocoulombs the, uh, sorry p was plus 3 plus 3 uh, nanocoulombs and it's now it was initially plus 3 nanocoulombs and the final is equal to minus one and a half nanocoulombs. So the way that I like to do this is to just to put a visual sketch together so that we can see where we're going. So put it on a number line. We say there's our number line, minus one and a half, there's zero, that would be neutral, and there's plus three. So how are we going to work it out? Well, if I was to go from plus three, I've lost three nanocoulombs and I've lost another one and a half nanocoulombs. So what is the total? I hope you can see that the total uh, electrons that P is gaining, uh, it's in fact getting negative charges, um, is going to be minus 1,5, 1, minus 4,5 nanocoulombs. Okay? If you want to do it formally, you can do as well, and you can just do the change in charge is equal to P final uh, minus P initial, and if you substitute those numbers in, you'll get exactly the same answer, minus 1,5, minus 3, and you'll see that's minus 4,5 nanocoulombs, which is equal to minus 4,5 times 10 to the minus 9 Coulombs. Please be very careful if you're using a calculator and those exponents. Don't let them bug you and get in the way, but please make sure that you check your answer. It's very important that even if you're using a calculator to do a quick mental check that you know that you've got it right. Right, the next part of the question. 1.3 says calculate the number. Here we go. We want a number of electrons that are transferred during the process in the previous question. Right, so in this process, we've just worked out that P has gained some electrons. It gained electrons. And the charge on those electrons came to a total of four, minus 4,5 times 10 to the minus 9 coulombs. So how many electrons was it? Well, whenever you want to find the number of electrons, we're going to say the number of electrons is the charge that has been gained or lost or is on an object divided by the charge on one electron. Now, this is really important. Charge is quantized. There is only one charge on an electron, and it was discovered by Millikan in the Millikan oil drop experiment. He found that the charge on an electron is minus 1,6 times 10 to the minus 19. It's on your data sheet as a standard unit. So we need to remember it. We don't have to memorize it, but remember that it's there. Charge on an electron, minus 1,6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. It's telling you that the coulomb is an incredibly big unit. The charge on an electron is very, very small. Okay, But we're going to use that formula, so let's put it in. We're going to say minus 4,5 times 10 to the minus 9 divided by minus 1,6 times 10 to the minus 19. Now I'm not going to attempt that in my head, I'm going to use my calculator. Right, let's plug it into the calculator. We're going to say 4,5 exponent negative 9 divided by 1,6 exponent negative 19. That gives us an answer of 2,125. Now notice that we need to give it to two decimal places, so it's 2,812. Two, we don't need the 2, 2,81 uh, times 10 to the 10. So let's write that down to complete our answer. Say 2,81 times 10 to the 10 electrons. I like to say what they are. We've asked about the number of electrons. So tell the examiner that you know these are electrons. They're what they're being asked about. Right, let's move on to the next question. This is the crux of the question. This initial part, they were all introductory. 
Now we're going to do the real physics. We're going to apply Coulomb's law. Let's see what it says. It says a third charge sphere carrying a charge of minus 3 times 10 to the minus 9 coulombs is now placed between P and T at a distance of 1 meter from T. Let's just draw that on the sketch. So what we now need to recognize is that this one was minus 1,5 nanocoulombs and this one was minus 1,5 nanocoulombs. Just check, your, uh, check that with me so that you can see where I got it. Remember, we calculated the new charge was minus 1,5 nanocoulombs in this first part of the question. So after the conductors have touched and then separated, they're minus 1,5 nanocoulombs. We're now going to put a, another object, charged object, charge stand, and we're going to put it one meter away from T. So I'm going to put, center it over there. And we're going to call that particular thing R. So this is R, and it's placed in that position over there. Put it in on the diagram that it's one meter away. So this is one meter. That means that this is only half a meter. That's going to be important. Uh, the charge on this object, R, see, minus 3 times 10 to the minus 9. So I'm going to shorten that just so that it's easier to fit in on my diagram and I'm going to say that's minus 3 nanocoulombs. So there's my situation. It now says calculate the net force experienced by R as a result of the interaction with P and T. Okay guys, here we've got to start thinking about forces of attraction and repulsion and start to see what the net force is. So I'd like to just do a little sketch here and make sure that we've got it right. So let's go back to our diagram first of all and let's recognize some things. If we were to consider first of all the charge on P, we recognize it's negative, and the charge on R is also negative. What does that mean? we know that like charges repel. So that means that P is going to exert a force on R that repels it. In other words, it pushes it to the right. What about T? It's also negative. And, this is ne and R is negative, so there's going to be a force over here that pushes it to the left. And that's what they're saying about net force. So what we're going to recognize now is what causes the force of attraction and repulsion. Well, you should really remember Coulomb's law. What does Coulomb's law say? Well, it is indicated by this equation. It says F is equal to K, Q1, Q2 over R squared. So if we look at the comparison now, and we say we're comparing the force that P exerts on R and the force that T exerts on R, which one is going to be bigger, which one is going to be smaller? What happens when we combine them? Well, let's just do some forward thinking and let's recognize some things. That if we look at P and R, we're dealing with a, a charge of minus 1,5 nanocoulombs and R is a charge of minus 3 nanocoulombs. And look at, guys, the charge on T is also the same. It's minus 1,5 and minus 3. So the factor that we're not going to have to worry about is the charge. But notice that the distance here is different. So these forces aren't going to be equal. Which one is going to be stronger? Which one is going to be weaker? Well, we know from Coulomb's law that the force is directly proportional to 1 over R squared. That means that the, the distance is bigger, the force is much smaller. If we change the distance, we're going to change the size of the force. So you need to be reminded about these relationships and make sure that you can apply them. We're going to do just that here. So I'm going to start off by saying I like the distance 1 because it's a nice uh, denominator. I'm going to work out, first of all, the force of T on R. And I'm going to work out the force of T on R, and I'm going to substitute into my equation. Right, let's substitute in. We're going to say K, remember from the data sheet, 9 times 10 to the 9 
It's the, val the specific value. Now, what about the Q1? Now, guys, here, remember, I changed it to nanocoulombs. We can't use nanocoulombs here. We must make sure that we put it in the full SI units. Minus 1,5 times 10 to the minus 9 times the other charge was negative 3 times 10 to the minus 9. Substitute that in. Make my equation, the, the divide sign, very nice and long. The distance, is it in meters? Yes, it is. One meter squared. So what we've got over here is we're going to now uh, work it out and we're going to substitute in. So let's do it. Say 9, exponent 9, times 1, 5, exponent minus 9, times 3, exponent minus 9, which all adds up or multiplies together to give me an answer of 4, 0, 5, times 10 to the minus 8. Let me write that in. 4,05 times 10 to the minus 8 newtons. Don't forget that it is newtons. And because it's a force, we need to specify the direction. Remember, this is the force of T on R. So we need to say it's repulsion. Repulsion. And we can also say to the left from the diagram. Or we can say towards P. Either of those descriptions would be acceptable. Now, what can we do to get the net force? Guys, we could go and do the same sort of calculation back into Coulomb's law to work out the force of uh, P on R. It's obviously going to be in the opposite direction. We can work that out. But there's a more subtle way of doing it. Let me show you this. Notice here that the distance is the only thing that is different. The distance between P and R is half the distance between T and R. So we know that there is a relationship between force and uh, that force is directly proportional to 1 over r squared. We know that that's a, a relationship. In other words, that force is inversely proportional to r squared, which means that if you double the distance, you quarter the force. If you halve the distance, you increase the force by four times. So because of this relationship, you need to be able to work with them. And I would suggest that you learn this that if you halve the distance, half r, that means that force becomes four times. Uh, you can play with that relationship. And that's exactly what we're going to say now, that the force on, of P on r is going to be four times the force of T on r. And what can we do then? We can say four times our original answer, which we've just recorded up there, which was 4, 0, 4, 0, uh, 5 times 10 to the minus 8 newtons. And if we multiply that by 4, there it's still on the calculator, multiply it by 4, we'll get the new force. So let's just get that value down. Uh, write it in now. And we're going to say it's equal to 1,6 times 10 to the minus 7. So equal to 1,62. Equal to 1,62 times 10 to the minus 7 newtons. And the direction here is now a repulsion as well. It's also repulsion. But this time, it's to the right. It's in the opposite direction. So if I want to just sketch this at the moment, what I need to see is if this is point R. We're just doing a free body diagram with some forces in. Notice how mechanics comes into electrostatics. What we're saying is that there is a force to the right that is 4F. 
and there was a force to the left that was F. So we want the net force. Well, guys, can you see what we need to decide with like any mechanics problem? We need to decide a direction. So let's say that to the right is positive. And therefore, we're going to say the net force is going to be uh, going to be F, the force of T on R, uh, which is going to be to the left, plus the force of P on R. And we substitute those values in making sure that the right is positive, to the right is positive, and let's just fill those values in. So we're going to fill in this value here of minus 4,05 minus 4,05 times 10 to the minus 8, I think it was, minus 8, correct, plus the next force, the one that's bigger, 1,62, 1,62 times 10 to the minus 10, minus 7 at least, and we're going to add those two together. Now, fortunately, that value the 1,62 is still on the calculator. So let me subtract from that uh, the value of minus 4,05 exponent minus 8. And it gives us 1,215 times 10 to the minus 7. So remember, we need two decimal places. So we're going to write it as 1,22 times 10 to the minus 7. So Final answer, 1,22 times 10 to the minus 7. But don't forget the direction. It is to the right. Check it. Go back to your diagram. And you can see you're going to expect P to exert a bigger force on R than T. I hope you've got that. Well, I think it's time that you just breathe in, take a break. We'll be back straight after this.